Today we're departing from the book of Mark just for a week uh, to a sermon that I felt God led me to, and it's in John, the fourth chapter, the 30, 32nd through 38th verses. Jesus said to them, I have food to eat that you don't know about. The disciples asked each other, has someone brought him food? Jesus said to them, I am fed by doing the will of the one who sent me and by completing his work. Don't you have a saying, four more months, and then it's time for the harvest? Look, I tell you, open your eyes and notice that the fields are already ripe for the harvest. Those who harvest are receiving their pay and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that those who sow and those who harvest can celebrate together. This is a true saying. That one sows and another harvests. I have sent you to harvest what you didn't work hard for. Others worked hard and you will share in their hard work. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now, will you join with me in prayer? <coughs> and now, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be holy and acceptable to you. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In 1909, a group of families living in an area called Orbank, because of the rich deposits of iron ore in the area, were worshiping together in the traditions of John Wesley. They were having cottage meetings at people's homes in the area, and sometimes they ended up at a brush arbor, wherever, whenever a circuit-riding preacher happened to be in the area. Otherwise, they were on their own. The nearest churches were too far for them to make it practical for these families to worship there. They needed a new church in which to practice their United Methodist faith. One Saturday night, families with the names of Shrum, Ballard, Norwood, Drum, Whiteside, and Goodson met at the home of Myla Shrum for one of these meetings. Filled with the Holy Spirit, Mary Shrum declared that it was time the group built a church. All those present agreed and they approached Reverend Thomas Coble, who was holding a revival at Buffalo School. Reverend Coble then enlisted the help of George Ivey, son of the Reverend George Washington Ivey, who is a leader in the North Carolina Methodist movement and a circuit writer. And he also enlisted the help of the Reverend Charles Hicks. The three ministers saw the need and agreed that there was one for a new church to be formed, and the church was born as Ivy Memorial. The first service was conducted by Reverend Coble. The charter members of Ivy Memorial were Mr. and Mrs. J. Brevard Ballard, Miss Edna Ballard, Miss Mary McGee, Miss Florence Norwood, Mrs. W. W. Goodson, Mr. and Mrs. Albert L. Norwood, Mr. Ralph Norwood, Mr. and Mrs. Joseph Ballard, Mr. William Ballard, Mrs. Alita Pope, Ms. Nora, uh, Noah, I'm sorry, Ms. Noah McGee, Ms. Lily McGee, Mrs. M.G. Whitesides, and Mr. C. Gaither Ballard. Now, by 1921, Hubie Goodson, the superintendent of the Lincoln Circuit, Lincoln Circuit, stated in a report at the quarterly conference that this new little church called Ivy seemed to be very active and growing. And at his suggestion, Ivy Memorial replaced High Shoals on the Lincoln charge. And now we come to a little bit of trivia. And it's going to be unfair for those of you that may not be members here for a long time, or maybe younger, but here we go. And if you know the answer, raise your hand. Who donated the land to which this church was built on? The Norwoods. Norwoods. Said, raise your hand. <laughs> the Norwoods. <laughs> In what year did the church hold its first worship service in the actual location known as Ivy? And who preached the first sermon? Anybody? 1910. Mm -hmm. And it was Thomas Goebel who preached the first sermon. If you don't get this right, I don't know what I'm going to do. What was the first hymn sung at this church? All things ready. Come to the feast. Yep, we sing it every year at homecoming. 
Who was the first Sunday school superintendent? Does anybody know that? Bobby is digging through that memory. Thomas Whitesides. When did the first building that was built here stop being used for worship? It's kind of a trick question. Slightly. Anybody know that? What happened to the first church building? There was a, there was a severe storm in 1945 that so damaged the church, they repaired it enough to make it work for two more years, and then they decided it had to be torn down and a new church was built. All right. Thanks for your little participation in this history lesson. When reading through our church history, it's easy to see the enthusiasm and desire it took to build this wonderful sanctuary in which we now worship. It's also possible, if you read the history, to see the highs and the lows through which this wonderful congregation survived. But I want to ask each of you a question. Are you happy with the current status of the church? Membership is down, donations are down, Sunday school classrooms are empty, we have a fledgling youth program, which has yet to hold a meeting this year. Uh, where are the willing workers to carry out God's work and our mission here in Maiden? Are we indeed comfortable with the fact that 20% of the people do 80% of the work? And possibly, more importantly, have we as a congregation forgotten our purpose, our mission to know Christ, serve Christ, and to share Christ? In our scripture lesson today, we see that Jesus, we meet with Jesus just after he finished talking. In fact, he's in the middle of talking with the Samaritan woman at the well. He has sent his disciples off to get food. They've come back. After ministering to the woman, they come back to Jesus and urge him to eat. And what's his response? I have food that you know nothing about. My food is to, to do the will of the one who sent me and to finish his work. And Jesus receives the food for his soul in serving others. This is the mission of our church, to serve others. Have we gotten away from that? Jesus continues, Do you not say four months more and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for the harvest. Even now, he harvests the crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. I believe these verses speak to us here today at Ivy Memorial. Throughout our 105-year history, others have been sowing seeds, and we've been reaping the benefits of that sowing. We have not taken to replanting of Iowan corn farmer Ray Kinsella in a field of dreams. Costner hears a supernatural voice while tending his corn crop. The voice urges him, if you build it, he will come. Build what? Who will come? As Ray ignores this voice, the urging grows stronger and more insistent. If you build it, he will come. The spirit finally shows him that the it is a baseball diamond in the middle of his cornfield. The he to which he, the spirit refers is Shoeless Joe Jackson, who was a member of the Chicago White Sox, who were known as the Chicago Black Sox, because of a scandal when he, along with seven other members of the team, were accused of intentionally losing the 1919 World Series. Well, Ray doesn't question the spirit, once his task is revealed to him, he simply sets out to build this baseball diamond. And think of Ray and his wife Annie as a modern day Abram and Sarah. They don't know where they're going, but they are pretty sure that something great is going to happen by answering the call. As we soon see, however, Ray is just starting the adventure. If he thought something incredible was going to happen just because he built a baseball field, he had another thing coming. That's kind of like us, don't you think? Where our ancestors first decided to move away from cottage meetings to building a new church, do you think they thought if, they, if we build it, they will come? Do you believe that they were only content with the new building? 
No, I dare say that they realized that the church is not the building, but the people in it. And more likely, they said, we have built it. Will they come? In Matthew 5, 14, 16, Jesus tells his disciples, you are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do the people build a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and give its light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. The light has to shine. But how can we make that happen? All of us have God-given gifts and abilities. Are we using them to our great potential? Are we hiding them under a bowl or under a bed? By not using our gifts and nurturing them, we have let them become atrophied. It's not like exercising. Over time, our muscles diminish and break down, and we become weak. It is through our continual working out that we build strength. It is through our continual working out of the spiritual gifts that the church becomes strong and vibrant, letting its light shine throughout Maiden. In the movie, as Kevin Costner's character finishes building his field of dreams, the supernatural voice comes to him again, urging him to ease his pain. Now, Ray could have said, you know, I built it. They'll come when they are ready. But again, Ray unquestioningly follows the voice and begins his quest anew in search of the person whose pain he needs to ease. Ray believes that that person is a writer named Terrence Mann, whose espoused love for love and peace was the motto of the Vietnam era. Ray learns that Mann's one and only unfulfilled dream was to play Major League Baseball. So, Ray kidnaps Mann and takes him to a Boston Red Sox game, during which Ray receives yet another message from the Spirit, which now says on the scoreboard, Go the distance. Again, he doesn't know what that message means, but he immediately sets out again on his quest. Now, unbeknownst to him, Ray is ministering to those along his path, spreading the healing power brought by this spirit. Man, who also hears the same voice, decides to accompany him on his journey to answer the voice's call. He is Aaron to raise Moses. Man, a writer will be the person to share the adventure with the others and to speak for Ray. At Ivy Memorial, there is no doubt that we have seen better times. Now, we may be in the valley and darkness may be surrounding us, but there is a glimmer of light shining just beyond that next hill. The adventure continues. We can't stop complacent in our old age. We can be born anew. Again, in the movie, the voice speaks to Ray and man, go the distance. During the ball game, they both received the message that they should head to Minnesota in search of Otto Moonlight Graham. Graham, as we find out, played one inning of baseball, never getting to face a major league hitter, pitcher, excuse me. Disappointed, Graham gives up his dream and becomes a small town doctor. He's a success. But he's long since died by the time Ray and Man make it to his hometown. So as Ray goes for a walk, he is suddenly and magically transported into the 1970s where he finds old Doc Graham walking down the sidewalk. Ray learns that Doc has given up his dream of baseball he'd so long faced, uh, go faced, and he wants to still face a major league picture. But how can he? He's been dead for 15 years. Ray and man head back to Iowa, unsure of what they're heading, why they're heading there. But as they drive, they meet this young hitchhiker who just wants to head to the Midwest because he hears their baseball fields all around. The young man is Moonlight Graham, now a Lazarus figure. Not only is he alive, but now he's no longer old, but born again to continue his dream. The trio head for Iowa's farm slash baseball field, where Graham finally will get to stare down a major league pitcher. Ray and Man have become the symbolic hands and feet of hand and feet of Christ, bringing others to see the miracles that God has in store for them. And as they make it back to the farm, a complete baseball game can now happen 
because there are two full teams on the field. Doc Graham does get to play, but has to leave the field, forever giving up his dream to save Ray's choking daughter. It is apparent that Graham is not complacent just to be part of the game. He knows that his life has some more meaning. He has gone the distance, run the good race, and now can be at rest. Finally, Ray receives an unexpected reward. One of the players on this field is his dead, estranged father. Ray gets the chance to play one more game of catch with his father. If you build it, he will come, ease his pain, go the distance. All mean reconciliation for Ray and for his father. Well, what can we learn from this movie? A lot. A Field of Dreams tells us that when God calls us, we should follow, regardless of our fear of failing. We can't be complacent that thinking that just because we have built it, they are sure to come. If we are to once again be a thriving church doing God's will, we must be willing to go and seek the least and the lost. We must reach out to the community around us. We must ease their pain, whatever that may be. There are those so many ways that we can reach them. It takes us building our field of dreams. It just takes willing workers with ideas, unafraid to step from their comfort zones and take a leap of faith to reach others, being unafraid to make our church more diverse, not only in race, but social upbringing. Simple ideas that we can do, such as passing out church brochures to neighboring houses, inviting them to join us holding a community block party or a Christmas, Christmas festival in our parking lot, other activities, games for all ages, F uh, free Friday night movies, turn our fellowship hall into a family-oriented night of free movies, popcorn and drinks in the off football season. By the way. There are plenty of ways for the creative people here at Ivy to conceive and build upon I know there are skeptics that say we can't afford to do these types of ministries. They're afraid of change, afraid that we won't have the money. But if we as a people of God will take a leap of faith and pray, we can do great things. We can ease their pain by going the distance. In 1 Corinthians 12, 14 through 31, Paul reminds us that the body of Christ is made up of many parts, no more important than the other. He points out that we are all members of that body and that we serve important purposes. Verses 27 through 31 say, Now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is part of it. And in the church, God has appointed, first of all, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then workers of miracles, also those having gifts of healing, those able to help others, those with gifts of administration, and those speaking in different tongues. And all are apostles. No, are all apostles? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But eagerly, they desire the greater gifts. In the final moments of Field of Dreams, man addresses Ray and reminds him what an important role baseball has played throughout the history of our nation. And I'd like to paraphrase that statement because I think it fits so well with our times and I'd like our grandchildren to be able to say this about us. Throughout our history, the constant was Ivy Memorial. The people of that church remind us of what was once good and could be again. People will come, y'all. People will most definitely come. We have built it. Now it is up to us to invite them through the doors and on to God's playing field. Will you join me as we go the distance? Amen. And now I receive this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.